ladies and gentlemen, this is our guys podcast. We know we're small, but we are mighty. And now your hosts, Josh Hammerling and Alex Mookie. Welcome back to another edition of the Right Guys Podcast. My name is Max McGuire. Oh, and I'm Josh Hammerling. Hey, Max, quick question. Do you think if you were to yeah. get a box full of toys for Joe Biden, he would play with them like an actual cat? Or is, is he just, or is he still there? I mean, such a quick question. Do you think he would? <laughs> no? He might. Um, I think he probably, given his affinity for ice cream, he'd probably have better luck with uh, like a, a saucer of cream. Uh, like um, maybe get the dots or something. Yeah. Like, put a trail out and see if he follows. That was pretty wild that he has a speech where he says he just the other day talked to someone who died in 1996. And Ducey brings it up in the press conference in the White House. And uh, he he was like, yeah, she's like, no, no, I'm not even going to I'm not even going to I'm not even going to do that. Well, no, the dude, Joe Biden said he spoke to someone who was who died in 1996 recently. Um, Did you hear the cycle babble in it? He he just started saying yeah. things like, "Well, when we're here, and then, then we get, and then, well, you know, I was I was I was talking to the French president. I was like, there's no consonant or vowels in any of those words, yeah. man. You know, and if there was something, you know, they're always saying Trump's losing his mind, but Biden really is. You see it every day. Yeah. Don't worry, that's in charge of the country. <laughs> that's the nuclear football guy. So, congratulations. Well, is this the mic? Is this president. the mic that's working right now? Can oh, you tell? Yeah, I, that sounds a lot better. I like that. I, this is the, this is the mic. Okay. Yeah. I'll put this a little higher up. Um, there you go. So we have a lot to talk about. Um, and the episode today is going to be kind of unmasking, doing an expose, talking about these four, but actually three Republicans who voted against the impeachment of Alejandro Mayorkas, Joe Biden's uh, Homeland Security Secretary. Um, the media... I'm going to put it on. I'm going to put it on the screen. The media has been having a field day with this, accusing yeah. the Republicans of not having their act together, not being able to uh, make it work. You can see here that the original, the the original final tally in the House of Representatives was 215 to 215, with three Republicans voting no and one not voting. The one not voting was Steve Scalise. He is uh, undergoing cancer treatment, so he was not there. But the way that the House rules work is that if it's a tie, it can't be brought up for reconsideration. So it can't end in a tie if you want to vote on the same thing again without it having to go through the entire committee, rules committee process. So what ended up happening was they saw it was a tie and someone else had to jump in and cast that fourth no vote. And that was Blake Moore of Utah. He's gotten a lot of heat. Um, you can see here on the Fox News graphic that we're putting up on screen to show them, Blake Moore was basically treated as a traitor. When in reality, the only reason he voted no was so that he could bring it up for reconsideration. And the way that the House rules work is if you want another another bite at the apple, the only person who can bring a bill up again is someone who voted no. And basically the reason that that's a rule is you can say you changed your mind and that you think it should be reconsidered. You've changed your mind and you'd like to change your vote and have another chance of voting. If you vote yes, you don't get to reconsider bills. So this is why often when bills fail by small margins, you'll have one Republican or, or if it's a Democrat in the majority, one Democrat vote no. Usually it's the Speaker of the House who does it. Um, but this is something that had to come in at the last moment because even though Republicans had counted these no votes from McClintock, Buck, and Gallagher, they thought that they had the votes to still pass it because yeah. Democrat Congressman Al Green was in the hospital. And what, yeah. what Democrats ended up doing is they wheeled him in weekend at Bernie style um, in his hospital garb, and he cast a vote. He so, came in at scrubs. They... Yeah, I, I, I believe not scrubs, but like the uh, the yeah, 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 the, like the yeah, hospital stuff. So they're willing to wheel them in, like yeah, yeah. They, they, it's all about it's all about the optics. It's all about uh, made for TV moments. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah Al sure. Green was brought in, and uh, that basically broke the Republicans' bath. They knew that they were going to have two, maybe three defections, and as long as Al Green wasn't there, three would have passed it. Well, Al Green, they showed up last minute 
and that sank the impeachment vote, right? So that, that's when you have Blake Moore having to come out of nowhere and flip his vote to make sure they have another bite at that apple. Because remember, the non-voting right here, Steve Scalise, if Steve Scalise was there, it would have passed even with um, that last-minute Democrat addition. Yes. So um, this isn't over. This isn't over. It will get another bite at the apple. They will get another bite at the apple when Steve Scalise returns, I believe, next week. They, they thought about trying to get him in today or tomorrow, but I think it just makes more sense to do it next week. So Alejandro Mayorkas will be unimpeached for a few more days. Um, and obviously, the, <laughs> the part that you have to talk about is if Republicans hadn't kicked out George Santos, this passes. Uh, right? Uh, Republicans. Did you see his tweet? Yes, yes. He's like, bet you bet miss you're missing me, me now. <laughs> yeah. Um, and this is what we said at the very beginning. Yeah. If yeah. the Republican Congress intends to do conservative things, it makes zero sense to kick out one of the most conservative voting members of the caucus. His personal issues, his personal life aside, he voted almost down the line for every conservative thing that came up for a vote. This also would have passed if Kevin McCarthy hadn't resigned. So if Kevin McCarthy didn't didn't uh, pull the I'm taking my ball and going home because you won't let me choose the game, you won't let me be captain. Um, we all knew someone like that growing up who uh, if, if they didn't get to be captain of the team, they, they took the ball and went home. If he hadn't resigned, there'd be him there. So theoretically, th I mean, this should have passed regardless if you didn't have uh, if you didn't have Scalise in the hospital, if you didn't have. Kevin McCarthy resigning, and if you didn't kick out George Santos, it, it never should have been this close, right? But it highlights that margin, that slight margin for error. So um, obviously, as I said, this is Blake Moore. He's getting a lot of heat online. Republican congressman from Utah, don't give him heat. Um, be nice. He, he did the right thing. Did the right thing. He he absolutely did the right thing. What you have to do in this situation, otherwise. It has to spend weeks going back through the process. Um, and, and this yeah. shows how quick the media is um, to say, oh, four Republicans vote against it. Democrats and, and conservatives were trying to gin up hate for this man. Um, don't, don't do it. Uh, I know you can't unsend emails. You can't unleave voicemails. Um, but don't give him hate. He did the right thing. Um, it's a stupid procedural rule, but it's a rule nonetheless. You got to um, play by the rules of the game. Like he's just playing yeah. the game, right? Yeah. yeah. Don't give so. Blake Moore a hard time. But if you live in Colorado, specifically if you live in like Douglas County or well, I believe yeah, was it was well. it eastern, southeastern Colorado? Yeah. Absolutely give Ken Buck a hard time. Now Ken Buck used to be my congressman. Josh, is he still your congressman? No, I don't think he is. Let me see. Where's but the I, map? Yeah, on uh, the county I'm at, I thought it was somebody else. They were doing some redistricting last time. So, oh, yeah, they did redistricting. Yeah, it was, um, yeah, I forget who it is and, at the moment. So I was spending a lot of time actually reading up on Ken Buck. I was shocked that he like put himself as like the Tea Party. He's got like a, an identity crisis, Ken Buck does, right? He runs as Republican. Yeah. He's called himself Tea Party in 08. He has voted for some really kind of conservative things. And then he's got all these one-offs of some really liberal votes, man, which is just kind of crazy. I, I, I've not been a big fan of his in a long, long time. In 08, I thought he was okay, but in you know, the past three, four years, I'm a hard no. And he's not running again. He's up against the term limits here in Colorado. So he's yeah, he's out, he's done. So he doesn't get crap what he votes on these days, right? He's He's in it for the game and what he's getting afterwards. At this point, yeah, Ken Buck's out. He's retiring. Um, the rumor has been he's had health problems, but those have been rumors for a few years. Uh, he looks like he's aged tremendously in the last mm -hmm. couple of years. He was not nearly this gray. Um, well, he was always kind of no. gray, but he, he he's definitely aged in the role. Yeah. This is the map that's on his house website. It might have changed, um, but traditionally it's been Eastern Colorado. Um, Fort, wow. uh, Fort Collins, Loveland, all the way down to Castle Rock, and then down towards uh, well, southeastern Mark. Colorado. Yeah. So it's interesting because he has obviously announced he's retiring. He is not going to seek re-election. And 
I think that is a really important thing to talk about um, because it's very obvious when you look at this that he's no longer representing his constituents because he doesn't have to answer to them. Um, I'm going to answer a real quick question from the comment section, though. Um, Max, why is the Senate drafting bills anyway? Isn't that the job of the Congress, the House? Yes, technically it is the job of the House of Representatives to uh, initiate any kind of like revenue generating bill, any kind of budget bill, appropriations bill. What the what the Senate's able to do, though, is take a bill that the House wrote and basically amend the hell out of it, rewrite it so it's nothing like what it actually looked like. We talked about this on the last podcast. Um, the bill about the border was actually slipped. That whole big border bit was slipped into a piece of legislation that the House had passed about veterans' health benefits. So they had to take a bill that the House had passed and slip their own amendments into it and then send it back to the House to either agree on it or change it again. But um, that's why the Senate, yes, technically the House is supposed to, but there are workarounds. There are workarounds for that. Um, so, Josh, as I was saying, it's very clear that this guy, Ken Buck, who used to be a Tea Party guy, used to be a very strong conservative. It, it's very. It seems like Trump has broken him. But even worse, it seems like ever since he announced he's not running for re-election, he's stopped being conservative. And, and this is a phenomenon that happens with Republicans. And it only ever seems to happen with Republicans. Republicans you don't yeah. see you don't see Democrats announce their retirement and then their final year all of a sudden become conservatives. It only ever seems to go the other way, where Republicans announce they're going to retire and start doing very liberal things or not conservative things. And that's what we've seen from Ken Buck just last year. We'll play a little bit of this and I'll get your opinion as I, I, I think he is your congressman. Um, he is. Yep. But I'll, I'll, <laughs> I think he's still your congressman. Uh, we'll play this clip and just remember, this is what he sounds like when he is still representing his constituents. Right. And notice the language he uses in this him grilling. Mayorkas, who he just decided not to vote to impeach. Americans are mad, and they are particularly mad at you. Yeah. In fact, even President Biden had to appoint the vice president to help you do your job. When I listen to constituents in my district, they believe you yeah. have intentionally made our border less secure. When I listen to my colleagues, they believe you have acted intentionally to make the border less secure. My constituents distinguish between your actions and the actions of other Biden administration officials. Americans are mad at, at Secretary Austin, for example, because he removed military personnel for not taking the COVID vaccine. Americans are mad that the Biden administration reduced oil and gas production, and we see the result at the pump. There are a number of bad policies from the Biden White House, but Americans believe what you've done is intentional. You've stopped the building of the wall that deterred illegal immigrants from coming to this country. You've terminated asylum cooperative agreements with Guatemala, El Salvador, and Nicaragua. You're trying to revoke Title 42. You are funding organizations that work in foreign countries to encourage illegal immigrants to come to America. The result is the largest increase in illegal immigration in the history of the United States. You've allowed thousands of pounds of fentanyl to come into this country. True story. Fentanyl overdose is now the leading cause of death for adults between the ages of 18 and 45. They're responsible for thousands of young girls being forced into prostitution in this country. The Americans I speak to believe you have intentionally undermined the mission of the Department of Homeland Security, that mission being to ensure to, um, a safe, to secure, secure, and to, prosperous homeland. To safe. So I'm going to pause it there. Great words so far. Great. Just got, just got to reiterate, this is a guy, he's saying this last year, this is a guy who, in spite of everything he just said, just voted, no, no. I'm not going to impeach this man. He just accused him for being responsible for thousands of women being being sold into sex slavery thousands of deaths from over thousands of deaths right fentanyl he's blaming him 
for all of this, saying that you've intentionally done this. But when it came time to vote, should you impeach this man? He voted no. No. How's that feel as a constituent? Well, you listen to it, and all the low information voters are going to be like, "Yeah, he's with us, right?" And they're just going to see the sound bite. They're they're, they're just going to think that he's on their side, that he's been conservative. I mean, he threw the dude under the bus, not just threw him under the bus. He he drove over him, came back again, and drove over yeah. him again, right? That's how that he was undressing him in front of his colleagues in the in, in the chambers, right? So it's good words, but questions are what I'm after, right? I want somebody who's voting for me. I want somebody who's doing the work of the constituents. And he didn't do that. If if his constituents were telling him that this person is right for the job and he should be fired and it came time to fire the guy and didn't do it, who's he working for? The establishment or the people of Colorado? And the answer is for a long time, it has not been the people of Colorado. This is the last three or four years. Certainly. It pisses me off, Max, because this is the stuff we have told them. have called his office and said, no. Don't do this, but he does it anyway. He's not yeah. listening. Hey. So that's where I'm at on it. It it, it just feels like political I, I think it's t- I think it's telling that when he's beholden to his constituents, when he's planning to run again and have to face his constituents again, the way he starts this questioning off is by saying, my constituents feel this way. My constituents are saying this. This is what my constituents are saying. So he's actually a, a mouthpiece a spokesperson for his constituents, which is what the job is supposed to entail, right? Yeah. But you'll notice when he's talking about impeachment, the the line that he's given has been, I haven't found the evidence to impeach. I don't think that this is a good idea. And that shift from representing the constituents to acting in his own interest, what he think what he thinks should be done, right? That happened. The the key differentiator is that he announced he's not running for re-election. So when you're no longer beholden to the voters, you don't have to get up there and actually govern the way they want you to govern. This is this is an audition tape for MSNBC, for CNN, just like uh, Jeff Flake, just like all the other Republicans who used to be conservative yeah. and the minute they realized their time was done, ran for the exits. That's yeah. the difference, Josh. He... he he advanced his constituents, your interests, when he knew he was going to have to ask for your vote again. But now that he, he doesn't have to, he doesn't have to. There's, there's no way to hold him accountable. How are you going to hold him accountable? How are you going to hold him accountable? When a person of principle continue to do the right thing, right? A principled person would. Is Ken Buck a principled person? And the answer is, well, he's been a lawyer, you know. Lawyers do things to make sure they get their client what they're after, right, or off or whatever they're, they're trying to gain in the system. So uh, and when you said the part about it being an audition tape for MSN or radio or something like that. It is. It very much is. Yeah, because he's done radio. Like, luckily, you've heard him on a lot of stuff. Yeah. He, he, he's guest starred on a lot of places. And I, I think he's got a taste for the, the media because, you know, that's where all the all of the power and the money is. Right. Yeah. All the influence really sits in the media. So, yeah. Was that an audition tape? Because if, yeah. if he was running for office again and they said they showed the clip that we showed just moments ago about him mm-hmm. and being completely against it and does a 180, it is that is political suicide. You would not win with especially the counties that he is the constituents of this is some of the reds counties in all the state of Colorado. It just wouldn't fly. I mean, he, he shot himself in the foot. I also, I I can't help but think it, it when when this happens, when you see a Republican announce that they're retiring and all of a sudden their worldview seems to just shift, it makes you realize that they were just saying what they wanted their constituents to hear. Yeah. Right? That they said what they had to say to get elected. And then you look at the other congressmen and congresswomen and senators who are truly conservative, who are earnestly and steadfastly conservative, um, who who might not always say or do the right thing, but you know that they actually believe what they're saying, right? The Marjorie Taylor Greens, the Lauren Boeberts. um, They're ridiculed. They're ridiculed, and they try to drive them out of town on a rail. But the establishments will always come to bat 
for and always protect people like Ken Buck, who, who are willing to say what you need to say to win re-election. Those are the most dangerous Republicans that there are. And you would think in a district as red as Ken Buck's district, you would think that the conservative cream would rise to the top. You would think that you wouldn't be able to pull a fast one on the most conservative district in Colorado. You'd, you'd think, right? You know. But it, it's amazing that you, even in that district where it's that conservative, you can play the long con. And, and you can and you can hide your intentions and say what you need to say. So that's Ken Buck. If you live in Colorado, make sure you give Ken Buck a call. I have a feeling that they've just pulled the phone off of the uh, off of the ringer and just left it. Yeah, why no. take why take voicemails? Why take calls if if he doesn't represent his people anymore? I imagine the heat that probably is coming in from all of this, right? And like you said, the phone is off the hook. They don't want to hear it. That, the only phone calls I'm taking right now is who's going to offer him a job when he's done. Right. What is this agent looking at these days? It's, it's wild how unprincipled Republicans can be at times and how principled Democrats can be. They're almost always yeah. liberal, Max. They're always liberal, no matter what it is. But you watch rhinos like Kim just do about faces as soon as it's time to make make the next change to how I'm making my money, right? It's just crazy. It just, just pisses me off. It's, it's such dirty politics. And Colorado is so blue. Everybody offering you money and a job. It's just some sort of liberal yeah. twit. Yeah. It's wild, man. I mean, you, you've got to kiss their ass in order to get the money. Plus, the RNC here in Colorado is virtually wrong. They're F. Yeah. It's bad in Colorado. Yeah. It's bad. Yeah. So remember that? So the, vote so the next, <laughs> yeah. 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 Vote. Vote. And uh, the, the primary to replace Ken Buck is very competitive. I, I believe that's the one that yeah. Lauren Boebert's now running in. Um, uh, I, I believe so, isn't it? Uh, I couldn't remember if she was the southwest side and Ken Buck was. Well, southeast. she is. That's where no, she no. lives, but she's running yeah. in. in I believe district. she's running in Ken Buck. Um, and it's that's a tough yeah. sell, man. That's gonna be hard. Yeah. That's gonna be really gonna be hard. hard sell. You can be as conservative as you want to, as you are. Um, but when you live on the other side of the state, it's going to be really hard to make that sell. But she's doing it, and, and it's a pretty crowded field. Um, it's a pretty crowded and pretty diverse uh, of opinion field. So the next Republican, we got to get through this list. It's a short list today, so we're, we're not going to have to do too much. Um, but we should talk about these people because they're cowards, they're spineless, and they, they're they traitors, and they stab conservatives in the back. The next, the next no vote um, was Mike Gallagher. Mike Gallagher, um, let me remove this. Mike Gallagher, where's my screen? Here we go. Mike Gallagher is a congressman from Wisconsin. And Mike oh, Gallagher, yes, Mike Gallagher seems like a nice person that you'd want to have a beer with. And if you've listened or watched any of his interviews, you would have assumed that he would be a yes vote on impeachment in Wisconsin. Like, let, let's watch this clip. And ask yourself, after listening to this, can you fathom someone saying these things and voting, no, I don't want to impeach Alejandro Mayorkas? Here he is. I believe this is on the Hugh Hewitt show. Things, the complete lack of security at our southern border and the desire of the Chinese Communist Party to help us destroy ourselves, to destroy American global leadership, are intimately connected. And if we do not secure the southern border... I cannot look you or anyone else in the eye and say that we are doing our duty when it comes to protecting the homeland or advancing our national security interests. And so that issue alone shows you why Joe Biden oh can't have four more years in office. The border is an unmitigated disaster, and I'm confident that our enemies are taking advantage of that fact. So that was like a month and a half ago. Just that minutes. wasn't last year. That was the Packers were still in it. Uh, so that was <laughs> like a month ago. <laughs> yeah, that was like a month ago. Um, so he used this phrase that the border is an unmitigated disaster. That's a phrase that we often use without really thinking about what does it mean to call something an unmitigated disaster? Well, mitigation, that's the job of the secretary of Homeland Security to prevent disasters. And if a disaster does strike, to mitigate it, to lessen it, to, yeah. to ease the suffering, right? Make it less harsh, 
mitigation. So if something is an unmitigated disaster, it is, is a disaster that no one can or will even attempt to lessen. So when you say that the border invasion is an unmitigated disaster, you are saying that Alejandro Mayorkas is failing to perform the duties of his office. If his job is to mitigate disasters and you have an unmitigated disaster, he should be removed from office. But no, Mike Gallagher, after saying this a month ago, just voted no, I'm not going to impeach the man who's responsible for open borders that he himself has claimed are being taken advantage of by, uh, by foreign powers looking to destroy the United States. Like the way he presented that, this is a national security in- issue where foreign governments are trying to destroy us. But no, can't vote, can't vote yes, have to vote no. Makes no sense. Makes no sense. So I'm starting to see a pattern here about the people that turn tail here, right? Like the states they're from, number one, have blue. All of them, where all the states they come from are, are blue. They, they all seem to be just turning on a dime. Do you think Gallagher is going, is he up for a re-election? In two more years. He is running for re-election. They wanted him to run for Senate. He said, no, he's going to stay oh, in the House. Yeah. Um, so he is staying where he is. Um, that's, that's a bad look to say those kind of things. Just months ago, mm-hmm. he up against an election, an election cycle, where they're going to show how wishy-washy you were before the vote happens. I mean, it's, it's, it's yeah. that's just not bad. If you really believe those things, do you think he would have voted to impeach Mayorkas today? Do you yeah. think maybe that might have crossed his mind? Well, the question is, did his mind change in the last month, month and a half, or was he full of shit the whole time? Right? Yeah. That's the question. Because you can't say what he said on Hugh Hewitt's show and rationally vote against impeachment. Yeah. You can't. You, you just can't do it. And so the question is, did his mind change? Did someone get to him? Mm-hmm. Um, these are the conspiracy theory kind of parts of it. Yeah. But we know that they are pressuring members of Congress. Um, you, you, you know that it happens, right? So yeah, yeah. what changed? What changed between a month ago and yesterday? Her that he went from saying it's an unmitigated disaster that threatens to destroy the United States. And now saying, no, it's actually he's doing a great job. Because that's what it means when you say, I vote no on impeachment, that he is doing a good job and she, good job. she should be allowed to stay in the position. Right? But that's what I would think. You get to keep your job. I mean, try again, partner. Go get him. Right? You get one more chance. It, that's wild. Yeah, if somebody got to him or there's purse strings involved, right? We, you're going to be running. Yeah. You're going to need that money. You're going to need our backing. You're going to need support. Yeah. You know, don't forget. We might need this. And, yeah. and with the way the Democrats are starting to back certain primaries, you know, into someone's campaign favors in an election year, right? Or on a vote. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. more than on the table now, right? It, it might be the new norm for politics. We've done a good job showing how they have no problem trying to get everybody to shift parties just to get uh, votes done, right? Just to get um, uh, primaries out of the way. So, yeah. I mean, who's this on the next? This is what Cannonball just said on Rumble. Green Bay has a lot had a lot of questionable activities the night of the 2020 election. Yeah. And and that's where you start wondering if if in a state in an area where they have questionable activities and you see Republicans still come out on top, even with the questionable activities, it makes you wonder who is actually pulling the strings, who actually controls them, who are they representing? Um, and, and it's weird with with Wisconsin. You talk to someone in Wisconsin about illegal immigration, and they immediately—I'm I'm sure there's others that don't—but the ones I've people I've spoken to who live in Wisconsin, they're the first thing they jump to is, "Oh, well, if if we didn't have illegal immigrants, we wouldn't be able to run our dairy farms." So th- that's what they claim, right? Yeah. But that's a very different matter from what Alejandro Mayorkas has done. It, it, there's a difference between saying we can't have nationwide roundups of illegal aliens because the farms won't be able to run and saying the border should be left completely unsecure so anyone can come in that wants to come in 
Um, so I, I don't know. I, I don't know how it, is it because Wisconsin just so far away from the border that they haven't, they haven't experienced this. I, I would have thought by now every state would have experienced the crime the and the yet. consequences of open borders. They're not feeling the pinch like we are. Like Colorado schools are in the hole, tens of millions yeah. of dollars because we're a sanctuary city, right? All those those crazy new housings for the homes are starting to be filled with illegal aliens. You can just go walk up and down the entire 16th Street Mall and see the problem, right? We feel the pinch out here because we don't yeah. want it. They're still far away from the problem until they start getting stuff bust in. I can't remember if Wisconsin, or at least there's certain cities in the state of Wisconsin that are sanctuary cities. And if they are, they're going to be bust in soon. They'll feel the pinch yeah. when that happens, or they can change their 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 tune. You know, that, that's why we see it so much. Texas, Colorado, all the border states in the New Mexico start feeling the pinch, right? They start feeling nobody else did until the busing happened. So let's do some of this in Wisconsin. Yeah. See if it's going to change their mind. Well, well, Cannonball lives in Wisconsin, so we don't want to send to Wisconsin. Uh, but uh, he's saying he's never heard of that. Yeah, no, that that's the narrative that always seems to come out around election time whenever there's an immigration bill. The, the news cameras run to the dairy farms and the dairy farms say, oh, no, we, we can't we can't do this. We can't get rid of our workers. We we all the cheese would rot. All the milk would we wouldn't be able to function. Yeah. Right. Um, so that's the argument that they've always had. Um, and he says that Milwaukee has been getting some deliveries. <laughs> yeah. And, and listen, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> this, this border bill, as bad as it is. Right. Remember that Joe Biden his first act as president was to undeclare an emergency at the Southern border to say that yeah. there was no emergency without the busing from Texas and to a lesser extent, extent, Florida, without that busing forcing blue States and blue cities to act like Joe Biden. It doesn't matter how loud or how much complaining would happen from Texas or Florida. Joe Biden never would have even pushed any immigration bill had it not been for, uh, <laughs> had not been for Denver, Chicago, New York, right? These these Democrat hotspots sounding the alarm and saying that it's completely busted their budgets and is ruining lives and livelihoods. Let's go to um, our taxes are going to go through the roof, Max. Our state taxes are going gonna to get screwed in this is all because of all that other stuff. Plus, let's not forget, we've got a Secretary of State that is happily trying to get Trump, anybody that might replace Biden, off yeah. the ballot. I mean, yeah, yeah, that's... Yeah. This is a dirty state. People don't want to, everyone thinks everything's hunky dory and happy in Colorado. And I'm telling you, folks, it's not. I think there's a lot more nasty stuff going on here than has been. I think been Colorado, explored. I think Colorado will be the first major sanctuary state, sanctuary city to break, right? Right now, yeah, sanctuary okay. cities and states are bending, but they're not breaking. And by that, I mean, they're still committed to being sanctuary states, sanctuary cities. It's going to come a point. There's going to come a point where there's going to be so many illegal aliens being brought into these areas that the city is no longer going to be able to say that it is in the best interest of voters and taxpayers to, to take care of anyone who comes in, no questions asked, no matter where they come from, what their legal status is. Just, um, no. I think that Denver and Colorado, even though they are blue, they are a purple shade of blue. Yes, sir. And they are yeah. more likely to flip, right? Because if you, if you talk to someone in New York City, if you go to Harlem, you go to African American neighborhoods, they're gonna they're gonna tell it like it is, right? But the limousine liberal variety of Democrat, they're still saying that it's worth it, right? Wow. I think that you're gonna see in Colorado, I think you're gonna see a tipping point come sooner where they're going to say it's not worth it because that's it. This is ultimately a game of chicken. Who's going to give first, first right? Yeah. Um, are you, are you going to, how long are you going to say that, that immigration makes us stronger, open immigration, illegal immigration, open borders makes us stronger when you're literally out of money. Right. Um, yeah. And, and we, Colorado has been famous in the last couple of elections for not voting in new taxes because we are very anti-tax for his, for as yeah. purple and blue as it is, Coloradans do not want to pay more taxes. And what's going to pop is when they start seeing it at the gas pump, right? When they start seeing it on the cigarette sales, when you start seeing yeah. it when you buy a loaf of bread, right? And the other thing that was really irritating people over the holiday season that I noticed out here is uh, the usual donations that we give to the homeless for food. Mm -hmm. Just weren't going to the homeless. They're going yeah. to 
uh, the illegal aliens. Like illegal. there were not enough turkeys to give American citizens from a lot of these these places. They're they're just sucking up everything. Max. They're just it's like a black hole of just resources that they're pulling. And Colorado has Tabor amendments. They've got stuff in place to make sure that the budget can't increase, right? So yeah, there might be that snap, and it could be just months away. You know, the next fiscal budget's ten months away, right? That's that's not long in political no. life. You know, it's not long. It's not long at all. And there are not the long at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll see. We'll see. Um, <laughs> yeah. like, oh my God, it's gonna be bad, and you we'll might see. be right. It, it might be. I mean, you hope it is because if Colorado can't, and, and and it's a brutal honesty. And it's the type of honesty that is going to be the hardest to get from these people. That they, that not just that they were wrong, not just that they're wrong now, but they were always wrong, right? Because that's what admitting we can't be a sanctuary city anymore. That's what it means, right? Yeah. This idea that it's good for the city to let as many illegal aliens in as possible. Um, in order to retract that, you have to admit that you were wrong all along, which is the hardest thing to do in American politics. It's the hardest well, thing. It to also do in means politics. that everything that you've run on has been a total lie. Yeah. The whole party has been running on a total lie then. And that's yeah, yeah. you you make a good point yeah. there because because when it hits and the fan, it's gonna be messy. Yeah, it's gonna be very messy. And and you're seeing it already that this is starting to fracture the Democrat Party's uh, coalition. Basically, the Democrat Party has a coalition of people who really don't have a lot in common and whose interests actually conflict with one another. But the Democrats have convinced them that without Democrat governance, the mean old racist, sexist Republicans will exterminate them. Well, I mean, that's what it means when they say these are existential threats. When they say the Republican Party is an existential threat to the black community, that's what they're saying, which is ridiculous. So they, they've conditioned African-American voters to believe that they have to vote Democrat or Democrats, voting Democrats in their best interest because voting re Republican would, would destroy them, right? But if you're an African-American, you look around and say, whoa, 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 I'm voting for a party that's open borders. Um, they're, this is destroying my neighborhood. This is making it harder for me to find work, right? This is making it harder for me to have my kids in school because the illegal aliens are being sheltered in school. That's a rent payments in Chicago, in New York yeah. City. They're getting thousand dollar visa check cards, visa bank cards for food and groceries, whereas African American communities are getting nothing. Right? They're getting none of that, none of that at all. That's not so true. They're, they're being taxed to death. Oh, there, yeah, they're getting the opposite. They're, they're being the taxed opposite. to there death. A, and you don't have to be a political genius. You don't even have to watch the news every night to realize that this is happening. There was a second, I think it was on MSNBC, they were talking in a barbershop and one of the uh, one that. of the barbers is talking about his customers and he says his customers are, are, are going to vote for Trump because they they it's a very simple calculus. When Trump was in office, they had money. When Biden's in office, they don't have money. Um, now, whether it's that simple or not, probably a bigger discussion, but that is, you don't need to be paying attention to politics every day, 24-7, to make that realization, right? Yeah. So, and, and, and but there's other parts of the Democrat coalition that are starting to fracture. Um, the suburban moms, right? Democrats love to say, oh, we got the suburban moms. We have the suburban moms. Mm -hmm. It's becoming hard, harder for a suburban mom with a, with a teenage daughter to vote Democrat when the teenage daughter comes home crying from the swim meet that she didn't meddle because the boy meddled ahead of her who's transgender. I mean, th these are real topics right these are real yeah, issues they're, they're, they're happening facing now a ton of americans um so then you have to wonder well is am i really voting for my interests right is it yeah. is it is it really in my best interest to vote democrat when they're doing all of this um so we're seeing illegal immigration just like the commitment to transgender identity politics um is fracturing this very loose-knit coalition that's largely based on fear. Uh -huh. um, so hopefully, hopefully it completely crumbles. Uh, we got one more, one more Republican to get through. Want to remind okay. everyone briefly, though, that my new book is out. Check it out. Links in the description. Conservative's Guide to Winning Every Immigration Argument. 
Um, been talking about a lot this week. Uh, lots of helpful stuff. Lots of helpful stuff in the book. Um, and if you just want to send us money, we'll take it too. Yeah, 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 I'm yeah, just yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. I, I don't judge. There, there, there is a link. There is a link in the description if you want to donate to the show and help us. Uh, we're we're trying to grow. We're trying to expand, and there are costs associated with that. So if you'd like to donate, that link is in the description as well. This is the I'm final. Good of, for you. Yes, you this is the yes. final of the three Republican turncoats. Um, right here, he have Tom Tom McClintock. He's a Republican so nice. from, Calif from California. He's one of those California Republicans. And I tried to find the creepiest picture of him online. You, found it. you did a good job. I found it. I mean, got it. Yeah. It's not bad. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Tom McClintock voted no. And he is obviously, he's a California Republican. He's not a Texas Republican. He's not a Florida Republican. He's a California Republican, which is a different breed of Republican. Um, even in his district where he won, I believe he won with like 60% of the vote. You still have to be a little liberal to win those districts um, because it is, at the end of the day, still California. He fancies himself the next um, Kevin McCarthy. Oh, California, oh. California, California Republican. Yes. Yeah. So um, I do have a clip of him as well, and I wanted to play it so you can Let's see, see what he was saying just a couple months ago. A number of illegal migrants you believe we should admit into this country. Uh, Congressman, it is our responsibility to enforce the laws that Congress has passed, and that is indeed what we are doing. Individuals who do not have... So is, is there a limit? Yes or no? Congressman, um, individuals uh, who make a claim for relief under our laws and who well, do you, not you've, succeed... Well, you've already released more than 2.1 million illegal immigrants into this country uh, since you took office. That's a population the size of the state of Nebraska. Uh, while the Border Patrol has been consumed by taking names and changing diapers at the border, one and a half million known Godaways have illegally entered the country as well. Um, that's an additional illegal population the size of the state of Hawaii. So once again, I would ask you, what is the limit, or is there one? Congressman, last year we expelled or removed approximately 1.4 million people who did not have that for a second. legal basis to remain in the United States, the largest number in recent history. Well, actually, you testified that 72,000 illegal uh, migrants were removed in, in 2022. But in 2019, there were 267,000 removals. So removals are down under your administration by more than 75%. Meanwhile, in 2019, there were 458,000 border encounters, yet under your policies, we're now up to 2.3 million encounters. So again, words. does this sound like the kind of congressman who's going to vote to keep him in office later, later in that we don't want to play the whole thing because it's five minutes long. Um, he calls him inept. He calls, he blames it on ineptitude, which I think is, is, is far too forgiving. I think it's very obviously deliberate what's happening at the border. But even if you be believed it was inept, you have an obligation that he was inept and that this was all happening because the secretary of the Department of Homeland Security was inept. You have an obligation to impeach him, right? Because yeah. the, the process of nominating him and confirming him in the Senate, part of that is to make sure that the candidate is not inept, actually has the ability to do the job. If someone slips through that confirmation process, and it and reveals themselves to be unable to do the job, inept. You have the obligation to impeach them. It might not be a high crime or a misdemeanor, but it's a it's a ludicrous argument to say that you can't remove someone from office unless they're inept. Uh, if if they're inept, that a president can win two terms, and someone can stay in office eight years, eight years in this position even though you know he's inept. No, he, you have the right to remove anyone who is confirmed can be removed by Congress. And impeachment in this, in this example is the mechanism. But you have from McClintock a claim that, no, he just he can't do it. Doesn't see enough evidence. Doesn't see enough evidence. It sounded like he was presenting the evidence. That's what I was going to say. He laid out the evidence showing that they weren't doing the job. He, he was making the claim. You're not doing your job. And when the time to fire him shows up, 
he doesn't do his job. So why? Why why the about face? And again, it's another blue state Republican, right? It, it, it shouldn't surprise anyone that Republicans in deep states may not be as Republican as you think. So watch your primary scan. The second is if if you spent if you were a man of principle again and you laid out the evidence and it was time to fire, fire. It would have been pretty easy. You have the votes too. That's the thing, is if they stuck together, they have the votes, Max. It could be done today, right? Yeah. But it didn't happen. So so why do you about face from him? Is he rerunning for election? He, he has said sure? he has said that the problem is that this has become political. That's been politicized. That unless you can prove that he committed treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors, that it is unconstitutional to impeach someone for being inept or deliberately bad at their job. Then That's a really that wild dressing. It's a wild take. Yeah. Then why, then why make all those claims? Why why present all that evidence? Was it just for showmanship? I mean, we're just trying to get your rocks off and, and get your time on the, the TV. You know, maybe some of the talking heads. Yeah, That's yeah. Terrible. Like he, book he, deal, maybe. I'm reading. I'm reading the example that he gives. He released a ten page memo um, that originally the Constitution's framers had debated putting the words maladministration into the, the impeachment clause that you could be um, that you could be impeached for maladministration. And they said no, because that was too broad of a term. So they just said other high crimes and misdemeanors. Um, but what is missing from his analysis is that Alejandro Mayorkas put his hand on a Bible, I believe it was a Bible, held up his other hand and swore an oath to not only uphold the Constitution, but to see that the laws of the United States be faithfully executed. And we're in this situation because he has done the exact opposite. Mayorkas has done the exact opposite. He has not ensured that the laws are faithfully executed. He has ensured that the laws can be so easily violated and broken. Um, so it, it, yeah. it, it's not a maladministration. It's a violation of his oath, which whether oh. or not that is criminal yeah. or not is absolutely impeachable. Absolutely impeachable. And... Well the key so issue sad. here is that Mayorka s s stood in front of Congress, sat in front of Congress and testified that he had operational security, um, that the border was operationally secure, which has a very legal definition, very specific legal definition. And then they read him that definition, which means no illegal crossings. And he said, yes, he lied. He lied under oath. Right. So that absolutely qualifies as a high crime or a misdemeanor. You say that's a high crime, um, especially when you're, yeah. you're saying you're doing the job you're not, you're going in front of Congress and you're under oath saying that you've done it. So yeah, that all those things I was just going to ask. So what levels rise to the level of high crime? And there you go. He, he's just not doing the job. Yeah. And if you're not following the laws of the United States, what laws are you implementing yourself then? And that too would rise to high crime because at that point you were no longer, I guess it'd be more of a, a violation of oath, but you wouldn't be acting as director of Homeland Security. You'd be acting as a, your own government, right? Yeah. That would be even weirder. So why? Yeah, no. And like, it, it feels crazy that we know this, but apparently a member of Congress doesn't. This, is, this was a press release from the Homeland Security Committee, Republican-controlled Homeland Security Committee, talking about how he testified under oath that the Department of Homeland Security possessed operational control of the southwest border. They read him the definition of operational control, which is hard to read here. Um, I talk about it in my book, but I'll, I'll, you, you can go ahead and look it up. Operational control has a very specific legal definition. It was put into law through the Secure Fence Act of 2006, and it is not up for debate. It is not something you can choose to do or choose not to do. The Department of Homeland Security must obtain operational control, which means no illegal crossings. They yeah, cannot yeah. rest until they have obtained operational control. And so when Mayorkas comes in 
and says we have achieved operational control of the border. It not only is he lying, but he's giving an excuse for his own department's inaction because you're not allowed to rest until you obtain operational control. And when they read him the definition, proved he was clearly lying, and he doubled down and, and said, no, we have operational control, that right there became an absolute impeachable offense. But it, it seems stupid that we know this. We weren't there. We weren't there. Why is it that we know this? But they don't, Josh. Well, either they're ignorant or they're purposely ignoring it. And I, I think they are purposefully ignoring it because they want this stuff to happen. You know, who, who, whoever designed this plan to bring in a bunch of people, you know, the end game is well beyond me because he's, he's just a pawn in it. You know what I mean? They're, they're, yeah. There's something really, really sinister behind letting in all these people. If you had operational control order, we wouldn't have this problem at all. And watching that lie, watching that statement, to see the faces in the ring, know that he has not done his job, and then get the opportunity to take the person out of office, and they don't. That's worse than the guy who's been lying about the board, right? That's that's a two-faced move that costs so much. All the political capital they've been wasting yeah. on this stuff, man. Like, and just the way the party looks, it's like you're giving Democrats made for TV headlines when this stuff happens. He's just talking him. I think he's just he's just there to fill the seat. Yeah, no, you know, he's just there. Somebody to fill else is calling the shots. He's just there to fill seats, and it just it, it it's so frustrating because you see someone like McClintock who um, he's, he claims he's more principled than all of us, and and he has the true reading of the Constitution, and everyone else is wrong, right? I mean that is <laughs> if if anything the never Trumpers that we've seen have the same position. Um, they've revealed themselves to be the most selfish of all, right? That that they know what's best, and we're all terrible and they're all the virtuous and righteous ones um i just i i, I don't understand it, it, even if even if you believe this was true even if you believe that you couldn't impeach mayorkas unless he committed a high crime or a misdemeanor a misdemeanor crime um the there's a long list of these misdemeanors where he's violated the law there's a long list of laws he has deliberately and flagrantly sidestepped and encouraged others to break. I mean, one of the core elements of U.S. immigration law is that it is a crime to encourage illegal immigration. It is a crime. As a matter of policy, he has encouraged illegal immigration. He has encouraged it. So I just, I don't, I don't understand what the recourse is. If we live in a country where actions have consequences and anyone that Congress confirms can be removed from office, what is the recourse? What is the recourse? Well, they can never have redress. We, yeah. we would never. It feels more and more like a dystopia every time we talk about this, Max, because nobody's actually executing the law and the, or filling their fulfilling the oaths that they've taken. They've taken, and we expect them to. We give them the power so that they can do it, right? Yeah. Wow. Why does it mean? arrested and thrown in jail for for actual crimes i mean if some other country was doing this it would be a reason to go to war with them be a reason to arrest those people it'd be a reason to put them in jail for what they were doing but yeah. we live in this this world where it's just a pure aristocracy you know he's just answering to the high and mighty ones in the east this is why Everyone's this different. is why you won't hear me say it often but this is why i actually like this element of the of the British Parliament, where they don't call it impeachment, they hold no confidence votes, and and to be removed, it's a vote of no confidence. That you everyone has to vote again, and and it's very really simple. Do you have confidence in this person, or do you not have confidence in this person? I think if it wasn't impeachment, I think if we had a vote of no confidence, I think it'd be harder for the conservatives the the principal conservatives like these people to get away with voting yes right 
they they can claim that oh this impeachment should be for more significant things than this if it was truly a yes or no do you have confidence in his ability to do the job i i, I don't think they'd be able to do the the gymnastics the logical gymnastics necessary to explain you're, a yes vote if you're a person of principle it would be very hard right it would be very hard because yeah. you know imagine them coming back at you later saying well so you did think you had confidence and because you yeah. voted for this and, and and the entire board melts down that's also your fault too right they would never yeah. want to take that so yeah i mean i like that word for it uh yeah everyone well, it says high misdemeanors. He's, he's technically committed high misdemeanor after high misdemeanors. By high high body, crimes, right? high crimes, misdemeanors. They can be they can be low misdemeanors. Don't have to be high misdemeanors. Yeah. So he's um, given more than a reason to be removed. Yes. 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 And these three cowards, uh, and one Republican who yeah. came in and helped save the day. So yeah. Right? So let's make sure. W one good one good no vote. Yeah, but there's one good no vote for just to get through the game. They're not Republicans. It, it blows me away that they got elected, right? They still wanted yeah. to get the vote. They wanted to get the check. Are they in it for the money? Or are they in it for the people? Yeah. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Well, we're almost out of time. I did want to play a clip. It, it is from the UK. So it, oh. doesn't, it doesn't reflect our immigration, our asylum process. But it does show the length to which not only illegal aliens, migrants are abusing the system. But it shows that there is an intelligence be behind this that is not just these migrants, these aliens figuring it out for themselves. I I'm not going to sit up anymore. I'm just going to go ahead and play it. Seeing asylum seekers here from nearby RAF Weathersfield, where hundreds are housed, and the local vicars are kept busy. Around 20 of the men were baptized just last weekend. Being a Christian is deemed a reason it's unsafe for people to return to some countries. Your claim is on the grounds of Christianity also? Yeah, most of them. Most, most of the people? Yeah. Most of the claims are, are they? Christianity, yeah. So just so everyone knows what's happening, these over there, they're migrants, asylum seekers, whatever. Um, when they don't qualify for asylum, they don't have a legitimate claim persecution. They're at risk of being sent back from the UK to their home country. And what they're doing is they are being baptized, becoming Christians. So then they can argue that it would be unsafe for them to return home because they're Christians now. So it, it proves that they, their asylum claim from the beginning was fraudulent, right? Because they weren't Christians then. They had no claim to enter the country. But it, it is a fallback claim that they're using now so that the, the British can't even deport the ones that have been deemed deportable. And it shows that there is an intelligence behind this. These migrants didn't figure this out on their own. They didn't all individually realize they can commit asylum fraud by converting to a new religion. This is something that was taught to them, that was encouraged of them. Um, unreal. I mean, somebody in the system is trying to sit there and tell them how to came, right? This yeah. is how you break all the rules. I wish I, my defense could be after the fact that I changed something, right? I mean, that would be huge for everybody. I lost this way, but oh, oh I'm going to go back. You know, my original claim. I'm going to change it after the fact so I can win now. Yeah. Like that, 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 that smells of like a lawyer. You know, it smells of like people mm -hmm. in, in high places of, of government putting these out it sounds like groups of people you know it sounds like there's organizations out there that might be helping this probably non-profit like yeah. organizations and i'm guessing that's where they're getting a lot of yeah. this information this, this liberal non-profits or maybe people in government and if your people in government are telling others how to break the law and allowing them to break law but still punishing you for breaking the same laws in the country then maybe you need to think about who's in control yeah. of your country it's going to be interesting here because obviously you have illegal aliens claiming asylum to get into the country, right? But you can also, but really claiming asylum isn't the way in. When you claim asylum, it's to protect yourself from being removed, right? So asylum is inherently a defensive mechanism, right? Refugees are the ones overseas who apply to come here. What's happening at the border is people are entering the country illegally and they're claiming asylum 
in order to avoid being punished for that illegal entry. So when you have illegal aliens living here for six months, 12 months, however many years, even if they lose their original asylum claim, the reason that they said they shouldn't be deported when they were originally caught, I think you're going to see illegal aliens file secondary claims and saying, well, actually, I'm gay now. And you can't send me back. I wasn't gay when I came. Sure. But if you send me back now, I'm a, I'm a gay boy and I'm going to get murdered. Or I, or you, doing this, I'm, I'm a Christian now. I'm a Muslim now. You can't send me home. It's going to be chaos. If what's happening in the UK comes here, even the, de even the deportable ones who we've determined filed fraudulent asylum claims, they're just going to file new ones. They're just going to file. Keep doing it. And it could be just claims of uh, there was a landslide in my country. Climate change affected yeah. that. Yeah. And under That's, our rules, yeah. the climate change. Then they change, do TPS, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. It would be so simple just to the claim, you know, yeah. after the fact claim. Yeah. It's dirty. Yep. 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 Well, another bad news podcast, but. Uh, Show. <laughs> another bad news podcast, but uh, if, if, I, if I can really hammer anything home, it's uh, please don't be mean to uh, Blake Moore. You put him on yeah. the screen right now. Um, don't be mean to Blake Moore. Utah Congress did the right thing. He didn't vote no because he didn't want to pass. He voted no because he wants to bring it up again. But Mike Gallagher, Tom McClintock, and Buck, respectfully, let them know how you feel about that, especially if you happen to be one of their constituents. Um, so yeah, let them know. Yeah. And if you have a congressman or senator, even if they did vote yes, keep messaging them because this is going to come up for a vote again. And the powers of fear are going to try and peel as many of those yes votes off as they can. Yep. So don't rest on your laurels. You need to fight for this. Make sure you're putting pressure on your representative. That's it for this edition of the podcast. If you like the podcast, make sure you subscribe. Links are in that description in the little text release the video. Um, check it all out. We also have an audio edition of the podcast. Make sure you subscribe there. Set to auto download and you can listen to us as you are driving through and um, really quick. That's it for this edition of the podcast. My name is Max McGuire. Josh Hammerling. Remember, everyone, the fight to take back the country is not over yet, but the only way we win is if we all stay up and fight.